My name is Antoinette Salah. I'm an agricultural consultant. Uh, my question is about what's the impact or the implication of the humanitarian situation on the agricultural sector, especially for the communities <coughs> who live in the rural areas? Okay. Um, I'll take a few questions. And also, please do say if your question is addressed to a specific panelist. Um, the lady, gentleman here. Um, this is Juba. Could we just ask that uh, people are very close to the microphone? We were unable to hear that question, or perhaps the, the facilitation could, could just uh, outline the questions once they've been uh, put forward. Thanks. Okay. Well, would you like to repeat the question? Okay. My name is Antoinette Salah, and I'm an agricultural consultant. My question is about the, what's the implication uh, on the agricultural sector, uh, given the humanitarian situation? and especially within the communities in the rural areas. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Samuel Carpenter from the British Red Cross. Um, my question was about the, um, the research on uh, the impact on peace and state building, but also more, more broadly about how, while there's a need to do greater development work, uh, there is a real challenge around the politicization of of some of the the development work that multi mandate agencies are doing and how that relates to uh, respect for humanitarian principles and perceptions of humanitarian actors more broadly uh, within uh, within South Sudan we've seen that it's a very very complex um, uh, aid system in country and I think we need, do need to be working uh, you know not not just on parallel tracks but actually integrating some of this work, but from the range of actors here, I'd see that there's, there's real challenges uh, in that. And I'd, I'd venture that on, on state building particularly, I mean, it's, it's almost uh, you know, policy-informed evidence making on a lot of this, and it has real implications for, for the future of the country and how, how NGOs, uh, UN agencies work in the country. So I think we need to be very careful about this. Um, gentlemen in the back, in the meantime, I'll read a question from the online audience. This is from Serena Brown of uh, KPMG International, uh, who worked in South Sudan between 2007 and 2009. The question is for Sandrine, um, who noted that there were no local people with any capacity. And she asks, is the problem not the lack of NGOs with the capacity to connect with the multiple capacities of local people? Thank you very much. My name is Vincent Gassana. I'm a freelance journalist and uh, program maker. I was just interested by the comments from Mr. Lanza and Mr. Jog, um, among others, of course. And I on uh, extracting the humanitarian um, assistance and allowing the state to do what it should do. I'm just wondering, is there a bit of a dilemma um, in all of this, in that there will always be a humanitarian need, um, to some degree or rather, and there will always be um, NGOs and others wanting to do this work. And as long as that happens, there will also be um, a situation where the state allows them to do that. So the dilemma for me seems to be that um, the state then becomes a little bit disempowered. How do you um, extract yourself and allow the state to build up what it should be doing as long as the NGOs and all the other organizations are doing the things that the state ought to be doing itself? And how do you, you can't, um, you, you, you can't in a sense uh, encourage the state to be stronger, but in, um, on the other hand, by your being there, uh, with, with the best will in the world, you're still undermining it. Okay, thanks. Let me just come back to the panel and then uh, um, we'll have another round of questions. So I'll, I'll uh, come to Juba first. So there was a question about the implications of the humanitarian situations on the agricultural sector and particularly for communities living in rural areas. There was a question directed particularly to Tier Fund about the, ch the, the danger of the politicization of aid for particularly multi mandated organizations working for with a focus on you know, peace building and state building as well. But of course, you know, do feel free to uh, comment on this as well from Juba and Vince's question uh, just now on you know how do you continue to work on humanitarian needs at the same time empowering the state and at which point do you extract yourself and and how um, and of course the question to Sandrine um, I don't know who would like to take the floor first in Juba but you know manage it from that side <laughs> are you still with us 
Yeah, we, we are still with you. Uh, it was rather difficult to hear some of the questions, I'm afraid. Okay. So uh, I think I've, I've been asked to make a couple of points here, but then I think um, Jock will will also add a, add a word or two, I hope. Um, I mean, I a couple of things. I there was a gentleman I think speaking and he there was a lot of there will always be in the question and I I would suggest that well we don't want there to be always we want to affect positive change and in you know humanitarian action is is certainly sacrosanct in addressing the issues for which it exists and uh, I have made that very clear as humanitarian coordinator here. When there are burning issues, whether it's uh, in one particular county of Jongle State or whether it was to make improvements in what at the time was an inadequate response to the refugee arrivals in Upper Nile or Unity State, um, you know, I did everything I can uh, with NGOs and with uh, UN agencies and with donors and with the government to make sure that uh, humanitarian action was really the primary focus of what we were doing. So uh, I want to be very clear about that. Having said that, I do think that we have an exciting opportunity in this particular case. There are a lot of things that we can do with humanitarian action to also foster uh, uh, or make a contribution or perhaps use humanitarian action as a springboard to address some of the underlying challenges which we have in South Sudan. I don't think there is a single person working on the ground in South Sudan who would uh, disagree with the, the need to actually help the people of this country and to help the institutions of this country uh, be in a position to move on and to focus on 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 a different set of priorities and, and not have to just um, see yet another year of consolidated appeals. But I think we're also realistic about this. No one is suggesting that we can attain that in the next year or two. But it has to be on our horizon and on our radar screen. Um, I just wanted to underline one of the comments that Jock made earlier about progress. It's really fascinating working in South Sudan because there are a lot of people who have been here for quite some time. It's, it's, it's fairly easy to find people who have been engaged in what used to be Southern Sudan, what is now an independent South Sudan. And when they compare today to three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, um, the changes are pretty positive. And we could come up with a very long list. Jock mentioned the number of students in school, uh, the number of kilometers of road. Um, but we could, we could measure more, um, we, we could cite some, some, some more immediate examples. Um, the number of civilians killed because of violence over the past period uh, is shifting, and it's, it's still far too high. It will always be far too high when any civilians are killed because of violence. But the fact that actually it's shifting in the right direction, I think, is something worth recognizing. Likewise, with the number of people who are displaced internally because of violence. Again, despite everything that's going on in Pibor County, in Jongle State, um, across the country, there are fewer people who are being displaced because of violence. And this is something that we will recognize in our mid-year review of our, our consolidated appeal. So I, I think it's really worth putting things into uh, a longer, longer perspective, a longer context. Last comment from my side, just on, on sort of, you know, how do we bring things together? I think there, there was a, an important moment last month in Washington, D.C., an economic uh, partners forum on South Sudan. And one of the decisions taken at that forum, uh, which was hosted by the U.S. government and co-organized with the UK and other, other governments and, and the UN uh, supported it, of course, was um, that before the end of this year, we want to have a compact uh, along the lines of similar initiatives under the auspices of state building and peace building, the New Deal compacts that have existed in places such as East Timor, in places such as Afghanistan. And I think that this 
provides us with uh, a framework whereby we can actually um, get a clearer articulation of some of the long-term aspirations of the people of South Sudan and of the institutions here and how the international community can rally around those, whether it's on the humanitarian front or whether it's in, uh, in the development sphere. And so I think, again, you know, I'd like to encourage all of you to, to, to stay really engaged on South Sudan because despite what are pretty incredible challenges, and it's the sort of place where you wake up every day and think, oh, it feels like the first day. Um, there are actually some important things happening to, to move in the right direction, not without difficulties, not without setbacks, and we've had lots of those, and they continue, and they probably will. There are glitches in this path, but um, it's a very exciting way, uh, a place to be, and I, I really hope that you all stay as engaged as you you are already. His, his job. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. Um, okay, if I understood the question correctly about the need for continuation of humanitarian presence in South Sudan and the dilemma that the, the government and institutions of this country face, then I would say surely there will be some kind or another NGO or UN presence, like it is in even stable countries today. The, the question is, what would this be responding to? It, it, whether it is an emergency, which is different, or it is provision of basic services uh, uh, to everyday people, uh, where there may be not be an emergency, but the government falls short of providing that. So if, 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 there, if it is the latter situation where there is no war, there is no conflict, there is no insecurity, there is no displacement, but the communities in the remote areas are still short of some of these basic services uh, where NGOs might uh, try to chip in, then, of course, the government will have to find a way to incorporate some of the donor, I mean, some of the NGO work into their into government's own policies, because the NGOs should not be working parallel to the state. Uh, the NGOs should be responding to the needs of the state, but needs that are spelled out in a kind of a, pl a plan, in a kind of a program, uh, a development program or a service delivery program, where the government is falling short of some resources and the NGOs have to chip in. If that is the case, the government uh, has to, the government is always thrown in a, in a, in a dilemma, uh, South Sudan particularly. Uh, on the one hand, uh, this is a country that uh, lacks a lot of services and therefore very receptive to any kind of help. Uh, but on, on the other hand, it is a state that is trying to assert its sovereignty. So NGOs cannot just come and do whatever they wish, right? So, so what do you do as a, a country in that kind of state? Uh, what you do is, first of all, you, you don't want to be seen as too controlling. But if you are not controlling, what sovereignty do you have to speak of as a country? So there has to be a kind of middle ground there where you have your own plan as a, as a country and you invite whoever is interested in helping to respond to your plan rather than them coming with their own plan and the country having its own plan. And this is the kind of parallelism that has uh, made all this huge expenditure uh, in humanitarian uh, uh, programs, not having so much to show physically for it. Uh, the OLS that I mentioned earlier is a clear example of uh, how much need there is and how much waste you can actually do uh, with resources because of the parallelism, the duplication, the lack of coordination, the NGOs doing their own thing and the country doing its own thing. And so I think that is really uh, the crux of the matter. You have to decide whether what you are responding to is an emergency, i.e. people are dying right now, or a, a low-key suffering due to lack of services. And you will design your interventions uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thanks, Jock. Nick, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I, very, very briefly. I think, I mean, I, just to pick up on what Toby had said about the word always, I think that's a dangerous word to use in South Sudan, um, certainly. And I think we will see a lot, 
we we will see human we see humanitarian disasters everywhere, and that is a reality. But the presence of the international community here right now will not always be like this. And um, there's certainly a huge amount of um, attention and effort being put into building the capacity of the government to manage and respond to uh, humanitarian crises, building the capacity of the civil society community here and the national NGO community um, to respond. And certainly, if you want, working with communities and how they can manage. Um, so, uh, you know, um, generally speaking, and not to be overly optimistic, I mean, certainly we're moving in this direction, uh, and it's going to take a long, long time. Um, and uh, but, but, but it is a process, and, and it has to start at some point. And I think um, what uh, Sandrine had said is, is also very important to I me. Mean, hey, we, we're not getting the responses right uh, right now in a very challenging context. And that's important to note as we sort of positively talk about how we're looking um, towards the future in, an, in, a, in a country that has some independent capacity to respond to its own emergencies. Um, but, you know, the, the, the humanitarian coordination system, the humanitarian reform and the transformative agenda are uh, largely an experiment, aren't they? So we're, we're still working with that and we're still dealing with disasters uh, every few years that we, we're, we're finding we can't respond to. So um, let's learn. And then last, I just want to pick up on one very quick thing on multi-mandated organizations and the, if you want, the, the political implications, especially in a context like South Sudan, I find, and I'm certainly not, if you want, speaking on behalf of the NGO Forum now, that the NGO community right now is so very diverse. Um, governments like South Sudan, in combination with that, governments like South Sudan simply register you as an NGO. Um, and this is increasingly complicated in contexts like this when you have organizations doing either or. Um, and I think that the NGO community, and, and maybe some, some of you listening have been involved with, familiar with the Joint Standards Initiative, which touches on this very lightly in some ways. The NGO community is in serious need of some self-reflection um, in the way that they work, in the context that they engage in. Because South Sudan has um, extreme um, context in both directions, um, it really highlights an issue with NGOs, which is um, you, can't, you can't have a principled response in one place and if you want, compromise those principles for practicality in another place or for the sake of a different program modality. So I think the, the if you want, the multi-mandated NGO issue is, is an issue in the sector. It's an issue in the NGO sector. And as the sector grows and becomes more diverse, we're going to see a need to, to think about how, how we're labeling ourselves, how we're categorizing NGOs. And the label NGO will find is now, in my opinion, in South Sudan, insufficient. It's insufficient. There's, you cannot label every non-governmental organization that has a mandate for development or humanitarian or both, uh, security sector reform, um, governance and rule of law and all of these things. You cannot put them in the same category, not in a context like this, because they interact with the government in different ways, they interact with the people in different ways, and they interact with different sets of principles uh, and, and operational standards. And that is, that is a high risk for our organizations here. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, Sarah, do you have anything to add on this issue on the multi-mandated organizations and the risk of politicization? Um, I can touch on it, and shall I answer also the question? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's a really good question, and it's something that our, our research did grapple with in terms of when the results started to come out and we went to South Sudan and we were talking with different agencies, the immediate um, sort of pushback, e even within Tier Fund, from the humanitarian side of saying, being we're very wary of peace building and state building in terms of potentially compromising our um, humanitarian imperative is where we work and the principles and you know, we don't want to start um, being affiliated with different sides. We're worried about maybe compromising our access. We're worried about potentially the impact that could have on our staff security and all of those different sort of di dilemmas. And I think um, the thing that came back is that this point that we want to contextualize what we found. So it's sort of saying that um, there's a range. And as Nick was sort of saying, you've got sort of the extreme, very, very sort of classic emergency response that you set had in Maban through the development and where exactly should you start putting the peace building and state building lens? A lot of people say it's only for the development end of the spectrum. but And maybe it isn't appropriate for your classic 
um, emergency responses like the one in Mabam, maybe where there isn't the opportunities and there are the risks, but there's a whole raft of things in between. And so I guess it was trying to say that there's a lot of discussions that we can have about how we work for those of us that work maybe in between more on the early recovery humanitarian side about looking at how we deliver our services and particularly getting our own house in order. I mean, we found that particularly we, a lot of NGOs would have policy commitments to doing very good conflict analysis and conflict sensitivity, but then a lot of those things might sit on the shelf, they wouldn't get updated, they would be done very quickly in terms of often rushed or not with the right people. And so challenges around that, um, that are we actually doing no harm when we go in? Um, and But also that inherently when you are there in an area, maybe like Tier Fund for 10, 15 years doing a humanitarian work, you are having an impact where you are, and we are therefore inherently political. We're not political actors, but we do have to consider the impact that we're having. We're not outside of the dynamics in the settings that we go into. And so it's trying to sort of challenge our say ourselves by saying it's not appropriate maybe in all contexts. Um, it's very, very contextualise it and be modest about what we can achieve, but we must have this conversation about small ways that maybe we can change our programs and in some cases it's not appropriate I mean we DRC was the other country that we did um, the study in and the report came back even stronger about the worries around compromising humanitarian principles because of the role of the state particularly in conflict and so the pushback that actually that particular element maybe wasn't so appropriate in some settings so it's it's very um, different comparing to different areas but I don't know if that sort of answers your question. Um, Sandrine, the question to you I have to clarify was actually from Simon Harrigan, uh, who is a consultant based in Paris, has been working on, uh, in South Sudan uh -huh. since 1997. The question from Serena Brown, I'll read it um, in the second round. Do you Kay. want to address that? Uh, yeah, the question was really about the local capacity. I, I, I probably uh, didn't express it very well. I mean, the, the local population in the Maban actually is a, is a rural population, and we found it very difficult to f uh, find people even with basic numeracy and literacy skills. I, I don't even think there are any local organizations there. Um, but certainly we did uh, end up working uh, and, and having on our staff some, uh, some of the refugees who'd actually been refugees in different parts, in Ethiopia and in other, in, other, um, in Uganda, and they had, you know, learned, uh, um, you know, had, uh, learned some skills there. But definitely, um, I think, you know, our aim is, uh, in MSF, we're not a development agency, but we would certainly look to uh, supporting uh, uh, our staff and the people who work with us to um, to develop their skills and and be uh, uh, part, you know, be part of the the action. So we're not deliberately excluding local people. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Um, I have three questions from the online audience, and there is Dr. Arisa McPhail here also wants to join, and I'll take another couple from the audience in-house and then go back to the panel. Um, so the question from Serena Brown from KPMG was actually, uh, what are the government of South Sudan, the UN, and the NGO Forum doing to increase the contribution of business to the sustainable development of South Sudan? Um, for instance, through multi-stakeholder partnerships or uh, public-private um, partnerships. Um, <coughs> then we have a question from Catherine Dom of Mokoro Limited, who is working in South Sudan for the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning through the Budget Strengthening Initiative of ODI. Um, and this is a question addressed to Jock. Um, so Jock, could you say what you think the government of Sudan could and should do to change this feeling of self-doubt and what could and should donors and NGOs do? And finally, from the online audience, we have a question from Elizabeth Lacey of the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation um, in Cape Town. The question is directed to Toby Lanzer. Um, Toby, Elizabeth asks, can you brief us on the severe humanitarian crisis currently unfolding in Jonglei? She says, I have concern regarding your comment that the overall percentage of IDPs are decreasing, where there is little access to Peebor County. How can the crisis and the emergency be addressed quickly to prevent Jonglei descending into war? And she also asks, are there any mediation efforts underway to sustainably address the sources of conflict, and how can we as members of the international community assist? 
Um, so these are the questions from the online audience. Uh, Dr. Alistair McPhail and another couple of colleagues here in London, then I'll come back to Juba. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to talk. Hello, everyone in Juba and in London and elsewhere. Um, I should say, uh, as Sarah said, I'm Alistair McPhail, and then till, till two months ago, I was the British ambassador in Juba um, after long connections with Sudan, southern Sudan, peace process, peace processes. We miss you here. <laughs> <laughs> you say that now, Toby. <laughs> Hello, Alistair. <laughs> uh, I think one thing I'm surprised not to have heard today um, is mention of the oil shutdown. If we're talking about a change in context, then the oil shutdown was perhaps the biggest impact felt by any government in the world in a long, long time. Um, I don't know of any other countries where a government or a country's GDP has fallen by 98% overnight. And if you're talking about a change in context, then it's very difficult to ignore the impact of the fact that the government, which was perhaps the sole domestic um, employer, um, immediately had no money. and. To Toby's very good points about the balance between humanitarian assistance and development cooperation um, were about to be, well, were being addressed in a very interesting way immediately before and after independence when we um, in the British Embassy, um, mainly DFID, of course, and other donors were looking at um, working in South Sudan in an entirely different way, looking more at development programs rather than the humanitarian assistance. But in order to do development work, um, we do need a partner with resources. And if there is no partner with resources, which South Sudan became overnight, then and if you still have insecurity, which is leading to humanitarian crises, um, such as uh, what was happening in Maban, but not only in Maban, um, then it is very difficult to do what it is you have planned. And we did have advanced plans um, which were either um, delayed or rescheduled or reprogrammed or um, rethought. Didn't mean we spent less money. In fact, we spent more. Um, but what it would be interesting to hear, interesting for me to hear um, from the people in Juba about would be um, now that there is agreement to have oil flowing, how do they think, and after the meeting in Washington, how do they think um, the balance between humanitarian and development work can change, given that there will be a partner with resources. And hopefully, uh, as um, Toby and others have said, that there has been some progress in a number of spheres. I, uh, equally, of course, the humanitarian and development work do not happen outside of a political context. Uh, the dirty politics does interfere. And in South Sudan, um, there is uh, quite a disappointing um, p political situation where the ruling party, even though it still doesn't call itself a party, um, is, has still to agree and spell out its own vision for where it wants South Sudan to go, where you have a government which is not spelling out a strategic vision for where it wants to take the, the country. And people uh, slightly at a loss about where they fit into all of this. Uh, Nick made an excellent point about the lack of capacity at state and county level. Um, there, there are some good people there, there are some people who are not quite so good. But when the trajectory or the direction of travel is to delegate more um, or to decentralize, although um, at least one state governor said to me that they have the most centralized, decentralized system in the world. Um, but if the, dri if the drive is to move responsibility, not necessarily matched by funding, away from Juba into counties, states, Payams and Bomas, um, then there really is the sort of problem that Nick was describing, when people who are either very uncomfortable with, with what it is they're being asked to cooperate on, um, or they're just anti it anyway, and the difficulty is deciding which they are. I'm sorry, I've spoken far too long, mm. um, but it would be interesting to get some feedback from the people in Juba, uh, but also perhaps here, I see some familiar faces from Juba days, um, uh, who take an interest in and work on South Sudan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alisa. And there's the gentleman here, and I'll take to other side and I'll come back to Juba. <coughs> My name is Al-Sawi. Please I am put your microphone very close to your mouth or Juba will not be able to hear you. 
Okay, it's all right now. Should be. <laughs> Can you hear in Juba? Hello, my name is Asawi. I am a, a writer from, from Sudan. My question uh, is related to the fact that uh, uh, the SPLF has got this uh, long road to take from being a liberation movement to a political party which is engaging in, in competition with other political parties. And this is, this is a, of course, a very complicated uh, uh, process in Sudan because uh, there are the two problems of, of nation building and, and state building at the same time. And would, uh, one would uh, uh, presume that there are lots of problems and this will impact on the, the subject and the discussion here, especially pro, uh, humanitarian aid and, and uh, relation to, to development. I wonder if uh, especially Mr. Uh, Joko could comment on that. I mean, for Toby it might be a little bit sensitive, this, this, this subject, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, finally, I think I've got Irina. Um, gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Irina Mosel. I was um, working in Sudan from 2006 to 2011 for various NGOs, and now I'm working with um, HPG. Um, I had two comments more than questions. Um, one on um, the point that was raised by Sarah Pickwick on um, you know, peace dividends and uh, I was just thinking, I mean, that's something I, in 2010 I was part of a multi-donor evaluation of the support to conflict prevention and peace building, and that was one of the key issues that came up as well um, in, in, in that evaluation was the, this focus in, in Sudan on, on peace dividends and what that means, in particular of the services that have been delivered, and that there's been such a focus on, on actual the, the delivery of those peace dividends, but not really actually looking at how they were delivered and how effective they actually were. And, and I think it's a very important point in terms of just looking at when you put a water point or like where, where it's actually put, it, does it contribute to conflict or to peace? It's a very simple, or there are some very simple, uh, you know, approaches that can be taken um, which, which are important in that context. And another point linked to that, I think we're talking a lot about state building and, and peace building also. And I think we're always talking about, you know, in um, supporting the capacity of the state or civil society. And I think one point I just wanted to raise was to look also at programs that support the linkages between state and, and, and the people and sort of look around what, what things can be done to imp improve the relationship between the state and, 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 and the society. So, for example, there are a couple of examples also in, the new in this new edition of HPN, um, like the article by George Conway on, on community security and arms control. There are a lot of interesting programs uh, around sort of engaging the state with the people around, for example, community security processes to bring together the police and, and community in terms of addressing issues of insecurity. Um, and similarly around programs of reintegration of refugees or IDPs to, to look at ways to, to make, um, d bring the state closer to the people, especially local authorities, and look at ways in which they can cooperate together more. And, and I think also like Jock said, you know, in terms of what that means for the confidence of the state and the local authorities in terms of engaging with, with the people and addressing services. Thanks, Lina. I'll just squeeze in Simon since he seems to be linked to what you just said. Hello, my name is um, Simon Gill. I'm based here in ODI and I work for an, org well, an entity called the Budget Strengthening Initiative, which is actually working in South Sudan with, with central government there. Increasingly, we, we've been grappling with the impact of the oil shutdown, which um, Alistair mentioned, but increasingly one of the things that our team's working on in Juba is, is working on service delivery frameworks. The government's committed to developing uh, delivery frameworks to so it can channel money down. There's lots of challenges about how that will happen, but in terms of picking up the thread of parallel tracks and making connections, I think there are going to be real opportunities. The government will put some of its money into these service delivery frameworks. They're currently covering um, water, health, education, and local infrastructure. And I think one of the challenges, I think, for this forum and for people engaged both with the government and with um, NGOs and development actors is how we could make these service delivery frameworks more effective in channeling funds down to the local level and addressing all the capacity issues that will need to be addressed. But there is hope there, there are changes afoot, and it's a question of how we can collectively make those things work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, Toby, Jock and Nick, are all the questions from the audience in London clear and also from the online audience? Or do you want me to repeat some? Here you want, you want to go? I can pick up on a couple of things. Sarah, um, thanks. I'm, 
I don't know if they're all clear, but I, I'd like to think that most of them were clear. So I'm going to try and pick up on a couple of things and then let uh, Toby and, and, and Jock uh, say something. Um, Thank you. I think um, what our, our friend from Sudan and Alistair were saying are somewhat connected in the way of, the, if you want, the condition of the governments, the lack of direction, and um, the history and the, the, the way that the SPLM characterizes itself. Um, and this can end up being a long conversation, so I'm going to be very brief. But the, the government in South Sudan um, was born out of and certainly identifies itself through its relationship with Sudan, and that that is a fact. The generations that have that have come up through and now, if you want, um, make up the the governments and the connections and the history they have with the conflict. Um, the SPLM as a political party. Um, interacting with other political parties in South Sudan, some of those other political parties, having been splinter armed movements themselves, um, makes for a very turbulent political dynamic, a, a political dynamic that that uh, can result in, in paranoia and sometimes even um, uh, very defensive policy decisions in some cases. And that, um, that does certainly contribute now to how the government um, is is planning and looking forward and trying to, if you if you want, maintain itself. Um, I, I, surprisingly, yeah, we didn't mention the oil shutdown. Um, did it have an impact uh, here? Absolutely, yes. I mean, interestingly, from an NGO perspective, the impact was more so in the way of um, of government regulations um, very rapidly changing in the form of practice more so than, than policy um, to try and. Uh, gain more revenue out of the NGO sector, which interestingly certainly ties into this question around uh, business in South Sudan, because we as NGOs found ourselves saying, hey, you're looking at the wrong sector as a government. What the sector you should be looking at for revenue is the private sector. Um, and let's, you know, let's talk about this. Uh, you know, the NGOs community in South Sudan is the second largest employer at the moment behind the government, as far as we can tell. We, our membership in the forum employ nearly 20,000 South Sudanese. Um, that is massive, and we collect taxes and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, for, for, for the NGO community to be viewed, for example, as, um, a, uh, as a market for employment, or um, it, we, we think is, is a little off. And so certainly in that regard, there's been these discussions around um, how and how the NGO community interacts with the, the 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 country and the impact that it has on the economy and and certainly large scale humanitarian operations um, almost always have a negative impact uh, long in the long term on on local economies and and in South Sudan we have a, sort of a chronic presence of a of a of an enormous um, operation here so it begs a lot of questions are there organizations here that are working um, with the private sector that are doing um, programming that is aimed at developing the private sector and so on. Absolutely, it's definitely happening. Um, I, I'm not in a position to, to, to speak about it in detail, but I would say that it probably lacks, um, uh, if you want, a wider strategy of investment. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I think we're getting short on time and hand it over. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> Uh, um, so I will uh, say a, a couple of things on uh, the question on self-doubt and how uh, the South Sudanese state and, and people can regain a, a kind of uh, confidence uh, uh, in being able to run uh, their state and, and their lives without uh, too much reliance on um, on international uh, contributions um, and I think the way to restore that confidence um, well there are many programs that the government has initiated one of them uh, is the work of the Ministry of Culture Sports, uh, which is uh, focusing on uh, building symbols of nationhood uh, things that people can rally around as citizens in a country rather than citizens in their ethnic groups and in their regions. At the moment, there is a strong uh, loyalty to, to the tribe, as it were, uh, to, to the regions, uh, more so than uh, to the concept of being a citizen in a nation. 
And so there, there is a need for a, a strong parallel program to state building. State building is what everybody is doing, from NGO to UN to donor countries to multilateral agencies. It's state building, meaning um, building infrastructure, helping the institutions grow, and uh, providing basic service. That is uh, what uh, most activity is uh, uh, located in. Whereas the, the, the other side, which is nation building about people, investing people in the concept of being uh, collectively belonging to an entity. And, and that would uh, develop a sense of confidence in the people if they increasingly begin to feel that they actually belong more strongly to the state, to the nation, rather than to their tribe. Um, of course, a, a country uh, stands on on basic pillars, and these pillars have become uh, wobbly when it comes to, to South Sudan. One of these pillars is a sense of political unity, and uh, that sense of political unity was gained and was strong during the struggle for liberation. And uh, when the independence came, this unity is uh, decreasing. Uh, as people fight for public office and fight over resources, uh, there is a retrenching of tribal ide ideas and tribal identities, and this is a serious uh, issue that the government and the civil society and everybody who has a concern for the future of this nation must work on to, to, to reestablish that sense of political unity. And, and then, of course, uh, one of the things that we did not touch in this conversation is the issue of the security forces. The security sector reform is not just about reducing the size of the FCLA and make it a national army. It is also about what is the, uh, the, the philosophy uh, that you teach these uh, soldiers to become a uh, national army rather than an army of, of a liberation movement. And, and uh, if, if we don't develop a sense of a strong professional national army, uh, the country will have very little to stand on. Uh, we also have issues with the civil society being weakened by the migration of, of uh, the leaders who founded them during the liberation years into government, uh, uh, gutting the civil society of its capacity, so that civil society is now being seen increasingly as a competitor for power with the state rather than a, as a partner in governance. Uh, and that weakens the ability of the state to stand up. And you have, of course, uh, economic development and service delivery as another pillar. And so with the shutdown of the oil and the uh, uh, stoppage of some of the basic services as a result, uh, people lose much confidence in their state. So these are some of the things that one would need to, to work on in order to, for the citizens of this country to regain that sense of confidence. Uh, I think I, I was responding to that question, but also to the question on uh, SPLM, uh, SPLM's journey to being a political party. And I think um, there is a great deal of debate going on right now about whether SPLM is going to maintain its unity uh, come uh, 2015 because of the, the, first of all, the obtuseness about opening up the political space for other political parties to be to, to, to have an opportunity to express their identity their agenda uh, but also uh, the, the 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 manifesto of the SLM itself uh, has kind of lost fervor among a lot of people uh, as uh, the ruling party it is not dictating the 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 program of the government. If, it, if you are the ruling party and your program of action for development, for security, is not being implemented by members of your uh, of the party that you send into the executive, then there is a serious disconnect, and the party will lose uh, uh, the uh, support of uh, a lot of people. And I think this is a crisis uh, for the SPLM that it needs to address. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Toby Lanza. Uh, very briefly, a couple of points to address the, the interesting questions and comments, um, and thanks for those. I think the first one, Alistair, on, on the oil shutdown, I think the implications of that were, were 
you know, on the one hand, they were terrible, and we've discussed this quite a lot, and, and there were so many negative implications of it. But the silver lining of the oil shutdown was that uh, the government actually weathered that storm much better than had been anticipated. It kept inflation and its currency uh, under control after a, a, an initial explosion. And um, I think that the real silver lining was the following. Country systems were strengthened, policies were, uh, were adapted. I think the donors came closer together, and I think the relationship between the donor community and South Sudan actually improved after what was an initial, uh, perhaps I could call it a, a, a shock. Um, and I think that uh, this has really uh, come to, to light at the Economic Partners Forum uh, that I mentioned last month in, in Washington, where you know one of the, the, the key outcomes was not only the compact, but it was the, the agreement to have uh, a private investment conference in December in Juba, because I think all of us realize and, and we agree that um, what will drive prosperity uh, in this country, first and foremost, in the long term, will be the private sector. Um, and, and so uh, getting the right policies in place to encourage foreign direct investment, uh, to encourage uh, the sorts of companies to come and work in South Sudan is, is going to be a very uh, important long-term issue on, on which many of us will be engaged. I think on the ODI budget strengthening work, again, very interesting developments over the past uh, eight or nine months where I think the work that DFID has been supporting with ODI or that USAID has supported with Deloitte or that the UN was engaged in. I think one of the things I've tried to foster is a collaborative spirit so that the important work within the Ministry of Finance taking place at the national level cascades down in a logical manner to the states and to the counties. And I think that greater collaboration between DFID and USAID and the United Nations Development Program on this, um, I, I hope it will lead to some better results and, and avoid actually some of the pitfalls that I saw in East Timor, where you would have um, engagement by the UN or by key donors that wasn't collaborative, it was competitive. And that didn't really serve the interests of the people or the state as well as it could have done. I think on, on the issue of Jonglei, uh, very briefly, there uh, has been an effort at political mediation. Um, there has been a call for that effort to be reignited so that uh, uh, the, the parties uh, can come together and discuss their problems uh, without resorting to violence, um, because the violence that we've seen over the past weeks uh, has obviously been... Uh, severe, and it has displaced um, quite possibly tens of thousands of people. Um, and the fact that towns have have been taken by one group or, or uh, uh, you know, are no longer under under uh, state control, um, it, it's not where we would want things to be. And I think it's it's very important for the benefit of of, of everybody that things in Pebo County and the other couple of counties in Jonglei state that have been very unstable, that they, that they really do become more secure and that civilians be allowed to return to their homes and to live the lives that they, they uh, have every right to live. And so from the side of the UN, we'll be doing what we can, both in terms of peace and security, in terms of humanitarian action and, and stabilization and development, uh, to do the best we can with, with the, uh, uh, the people in the institutions on the ground to, to, to to get things uh, on a better footing in Jonglei State. Let me just close by saying, you know, in many, many respects, when you look at the press outside South Sudan, you read about the Sahel, you read about Somalia, you hear about South Sudan and Sudan, and then, of course, there's that other very big S, which is Syria. So in many ways, 2013 is the year of the S, I think the real, the real issue is which of the S's will be the most stable at the end of the year. And um, I'll be working very hard with colleagues on the ground here to, 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 to make sure that it's South Sudan. And I think there's every opportunity here of getting things right. But it won't be easy. There are massive challenges on the horizon. 
we're expected to be helping the state to conduct a census, which is a very sensitive issue. On the horizon, we've got the reform of the Constitution. We've got a process of national reconciliation and healing, and in 2015, elections. I don't think anybody uh, thinks that this is going to be straightforward or easy. The challenges here really are immense. And I think it's going to take all of us working together in a concerted fashion, um, uh, highlighting the good, but, but also pointing to things that aren't going well and making sure that people are held to account when things go badly wrong uh, to ensure that, that the people of South Sudan end up being much closer to Uganda, Kenya or Ethiopia in terms of human development indices uh, uh, and not closer to places such as the Central African Republic uh, a few years down the line. There really are different paths that can be taken here. We are at a crossroads, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much for having included me in this very interesting discussion. Well, thank you, Toby. Thank you for being part of the discussion, along with uh, uh, Jock and, and Nike, for having contributed to the exchange with the leading article. Sarah and Sandrine, before we close, you want to add anything um, for the last round of comments? No. Well, then let me take the opportunity to really thank all the panelists today. I think it's been an excellent discussion. Again, thanks to the colleagues in Juba for uh, engaging these discussions without being able to see the audience you know, in London or, or elsewhere. We know that there's been a very active online discussion as well. Um, and I think it, uh, we, it's been a very rich discussion, wi which once again has reiterated really the importance of continuing to focus on these parallel tracks, uh, you know, Tobias, um, as, as, as emphasized, um, continue to have our attention to the development trajectory of South Sudan and sustaining and nurturing it, but at the same time, maintaining a very strong capacity to respond to the emergencies that inevitably will continue to affect many communities in South Sudan. Before we close, I'd like to thank my colleague Wendy Fenton, who is the HPN coordinator and is actually the person that's put together this issue of the exchange and I think has done an excellent job. And again, thank you um, very much to everybody here in London and the online audience. Thank you.